All right, I've got, what do I have here? One, two, three. Three of my guys. All right, well, we are now actually live. Okay. Well, so, welcoming everyone back to what is now, I guess, the sixth go-around of this. Um, today we have Mr. Wayne Bovenshin, who, yes, yeah. no, yes it is Mr., um, who is the professor of percussion at Oklahoma State University, taught Mr. Jonathan Norman Weber and myself and Tom McGillan and several other people that are out there, half the people teaching in Texas at this point, I believe. Um, he's also been a former member of the Phantom Regiment and the Cavaliers, along with teaching many no longer existent drum corps, such as the Northern Aurora, Black Gold, Suncoast Sound. Did I miss any cores you folded? Well, they all owe me money. <laughs> they all owe me money, no matter what. Awesome. Um, on the plus side, I think I still have more than you do of fold folded cores. Freelance. I, freelancers, Black Gold, Delta Brigade, Northern okay. Aurora. Yeah, okay. So, and I Northern still Aurora, win. you helped teach? Yes, the last year that they existed. Oh. With well, John. John. John pretty much folded that core, right? Probably. Okay. It was John's salary probably folded that core. <laughs> so anyway, so we are going to hand it over to Wayne for him to take everybody through today's chop session. So. Okay. Well, I uh, uh, it's good to see you all here. Um, you know, in addition to all the things that Tracy, you know, talked about, I've also uh, I went to Michigan State University. Uh, there from 1980 through 1987, uh, well, fall of 86, and helped, you know, teach the drum line in the early years. And then there was a, just a, a handful of years in between, and then uh, John Weber took over, and everybody knows what that drum line's like now. Um, it's, uh, when I was thinking through what I wanted to talk about today, it was, you know, I, being uh, where I am in my, let's put it, you know, speak the obvious, in my age, uh, I have become much more of a teacher uh, than, a, than a performer. However, I still love to just pick up the pad. I mean, it's a great stress reliever. And so, you know, I'm a, a true example, hopefully, of, you know, as you guys are younger and all that, knowing that what you do with this, you're going to continue to do for a long time. Um, just know that it hurts more. We, uh, I'm also, uh, because I look at myself as a teacher more than a performer, what I'm going to do today, and hopefully there's a lot of music education people, percussion music education people out there, uh, I'm going to go through things uh, as I would teaching a class on how to approach, you know, yes, playing, but also approach teaching your drum line. Um, we're going to do some exercises. The OSU people that are here, they have them all. They've already had to do them for their audition um, to, uh, to get in. But we've been doing the same set of exercises for a long time now. I think uh, the very first exercise, both John and Tracy played, uh, and that started in Black Gold in like 1990 or 91. So... Um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go through you know what I feel is important to do, and then the other thing too for for those of you to remember, um, especially those of you who march drum corps, uh, when you get into the teaching of a drum line, you have to deal with and no offense to all the band directors watching, but you have to deal with the band directors and their version of what a warm up should be because I've been around a long time and this whole exercise program that we're going to talk about today was developed because we would get to a site, you know, for like a bowl game or something like that. By the time we got the truck unloaded, they wanted to be out on the field in seven minutes. So what I, you know, designed is what I, have you know, termed the nine minute warm up, where you can go from eight to some long, you know, whatever, if you play Martian Mambo or some long uh, exercise, within nine minutes 
and feel like you're pretty much ready to go, you know, very warmed up. Um, might not work so much in Michigan where it can be 30 degrees, but I'll let them deal with that. It's never 30 degrees here. Um, and well, no, I take that back unless we're playing OU and it's like five degrees, but that's another story. So um, first of all, I'll talk about my basic approach to technique and what I've taught for years and years and years. And, um, and really, you know, there's, I know a lot of variations to this, but obviously the very first thing you start with is gonna be eights, uh, some, some version of eights. And we'll get into, like I said, the exercises that, that I use in just a second. But um, in dealing with that, uh, I am always talking to my students about, cause they come from, you know, different backgrounds. Those of you who are gonna be teaching high school kids, they come from no background. And so you have to start from scratch, but I pretty much use the technique of one third finger, one third wrist and one third arm, which, you know, for, for us old people, there was a time uh, and it was developed by my best friend, unfortunately, fortunately, Brad, uh, where there was no, uh, you didn't use any arm whatsoever. If you remember, if you've ever watched old Cavaliers from the nineties, everything was like that. All right, there was no arm used at all. And, you know, we've just learned through the years to get smarter that you've got to let that arm bounce, okay? So basically, when you're talking to kids, you're talking about like using a basketball. If you were to bounce a basketball, you don't bounce it like this, you don't bounce it like this, and you don't bounce it like this. You use everything. So uh, for everybody that's, that's here today, let's just start with some eights and just think consciously about how much finger you're using, how much wrist, and how much arm. Okay, here we go. One, two, eight on a hand. Right, not bad. Now, try that one more time. Just use, just so you get used to this, just use all wrist. All right, don't use any arm whatsoever. One, two, ready. Okay, cool. True, and I can tell you that you would be cut from the Cavaliers in 1990 because you're still letting that arm rise. Thank, congratulations, you play correctly. Um, anyway, uh, so what we've decided, or what we did, and it becomes very, very uh, uh, exact in how much we do, and you'll see this now. It'll be harder to see you guys. Um, there we go. So, you know, these are the basic exercises that we do. Uh, and just so that you can see, uh, you know, volume six is just a variation of eights where you're just talking about seven on a hand, eight on a hand, five on a hand, six on a hand, stop. All right. And so what we'll do is we'll run through this one real quick just so you see what it's like. And then I'm going to talk about, you know, how exactly we approach it so that your, uh, so you're seeing, okay, well, when I develop my own program, you want to cut out all the fat. You don't want to do anything. It's like, well, we've already done some paradiddle stuff, but here's another paradiddle exercise that is really cool. You're kind of wasting your time. You, you really, you know, the point is to warm up, you know, and, and get the hands warm. So uh, this one is just sevens, eights, fives, and six. Let's do that. One, two, one, two, ready? So that is, you know, that's basically what happens there. And let me see if I can pull this up. Sorry, I had to redo my phone earlier. And of course my metronome is at the school with my, um, with my long ranger. There we go. Hopefully that's something that you can hear. All right, so this is 132. All right, do that exact same exercise. Okay, this is volume six one time through. Here we go. 
One, two, one, two, ready, and. Now, one brief, you know, aside um, for all of the people that, you know, when you're having to deal with, uh, you know, your high school drum line or whatever, you're always hearing, well, the drums are too loud. The drums are too loud. Please don't teach your kids to play like this, you know, because that's the volume that can, um, that, you know, th that is acceptable for, for the high school band. I've always, you know, tried to tell people and, and use this in the future that breath, you know, support equals stick height. So whenever you're talking with your band director, you have to speak their language. And that is, well, we're going to warm up playing like this, because if we warm up playing like this, that's the equivalent of a brass player going and using no air whatsoever. But it's a softer volume. OK, so keep it up. Keep the, keep the heights up all the time uh, and warm up no different, you know, if it's a high school band, if it's a college drum line, if it is, you know, a drum corps. They all should warm up the same. Okay, so what we'll do with that is we'll start at 132 and then we will bump it up. Uh, and I do everything in, tw in, in 12 clicks to 144, all right? And we'll do that one time through. Here we go. Same thing. One, two, one. So we'll do that one. We'll do 132 a couple times through. We'll do 144 one time through. Then we will immediately go to playing that exercise piano. Now, again, we're still at, at 144. What's the per I, we can't really do, I know, a, a, a question and answer in, in this format, but the whole purpose for then doing a piano, and I would ask you, and you guys can mouth it, but that is you're practicing your inner beats. All right, because the thing we're going to do after that is going to be a two height variation, which you can see, you know, right here, we're at variation one. Okay, so after we do that through three times, then we immediately go to doing it one time through a piano. Okay, try to keep your technique exactly the same. All right, you are going to use a little bit more finger control, a little bit more wrist, you know, so you're not doing that arm, uh, but pretty much it's the same. So now do uh, volume six uh, at piano. Here we go. One, two, one, two. And that will then get you set up. When you do that one time through, then we immediately go to variation one. Um, something else, again, for those of you that are going to be teaching, uh, it's something we do. It's not necessarily right, but I don't want to do a lot of talking during the warm up. So our warm up becomes very, very uh, uh, automatic. Uh, and so, you know, hand signals, whatnot. But the other thing, too, is that. We do a close in between every exercise. Now, a lot of people say, but if you, if you do that, that means you have to do eight clicks in between each exercise, which does add a little bit of time. But what it allows me is to change whatever we need to change. And the only person that has to know whether we're going on is the guy tapping or the girl tapping, okay? So we'll get done with an exercise and everybody closes. If we're going on, the section leader is going to keep the tap off going, all right? And it'll be an eight count tap off and then come out on seven and start up again. But that way, if I ever want to do a cutoff, 
or I want to go to, uh, or if I want to go faster or anything like that, the only person that has to know that is the person tapping. Everybody else is just listening, and that's the way it's supposed to be anyway. So, okay, so we did uh, volume six through one time piano. Now we're going to do variation one. Now this one, it may be a little bit harder. You know, you may have been looking at it already, um, but um, variation one is, uh, Again, doing the seven, eight, five, six, and th this accent pattern was developed, so I can give credit where credit's due, is Tom McGillan. Uh, many of you may know of that person who's done an awful lot of work with Yamaha and uh, a lot of front ensembles and everything, and a uh, former student that, that really helped develop uh, you know, our drum line when he was a graduate student here. Anyway, so uh, this one, you can probably read through it pretty good, uh, we're going to keep it, well, we'll do it once slow, and then we'll go to the tempo that we were at. But um, basically, if you just look at it as four, three, two, two, three, it's probably going to be a lot easier for reading. Okay, so let's do this one uh, about this tempo right now. One, two, variation one. One, two, ready, and. Now, it may be a little bit long because, again, I've been talking about trimming the fat and all that, but it gives a lot of variation between doing groups of four, three, and two, and a lot of variation within that. And so that, again, it works for, for what we're doing. So now let's go up. Hopefully you've been through it once. Let's go up 144. OSU guys, you better be able to do this. Here we go. Okay, variation one. One, two. that a couple of times we may if this is later in the season we may bump that up then uh, to 156 but usually we don't we usually just keep it right there all right and we'll do it a couple times through the reason for that is because bass drums have a unison pattern and a split pattern so we'll either do it two or three times if they drop a couple of notes during that, during that, then we'll uh, bring it back up. Tracy, is there something? Yeah, so we've got a question from, from Seth Gray okay. on one of the Facebook feeds. He says, on the downstrokes or controlled strokes, how do you personally teach them to students on accent tap exercises without introducing tension or playing through the head? And how do you apply your concept of stick heights and stroke types to front ensemble and timpani? Oh so kind of a double-edged sword there. I'm going to tell you that, that we could go on for the rest of the time probably talking about that. Because, you know, and it is a great question, um, because of the fact that, and, and I hate to oversimplify, but, you know, and a lot of people, I, hopefully anyway, would agree with me. There's a lot of things that go into drumming, but you have to be able to do this, and you have to be able to do this, you know. The first two exercises you're taught in beginning percussion is usually eight on a hand and then bucks. All right. Now, how do I approach that? Boy, that's a, you know, that's a tough one because I will say that I'm, I'm very blessed now in the fact that a lot of the guys that will come to OSU have had, you know, I mean, thinking of the different schools where they're coming from, uh, Tulsa Union, uh, McKinney North in Texas, um, and, and, you know, a lot of larger schools where they're coming to me already knowing a lot of the things that you're talking about or asking about. But to be honest, I keep it very, very simple because everybody's another thing I get frustrated with is everybody's uh, arms or, 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 you know, your, your muscular and your skeletal makeup is different. And I remember watching some some drum corps. Uh, when, when they were teaching, trying to get everybody to look exactly the same. 
And I'll tell you what, there are some really, really ultra clean drum lines uh, from the past where you've got some guys playing with a, a lot different, you know, approach. Um, anyway, all I'm doing with that, you know, without adding tension, I, it, oof, that's a hard one. Because I'm telling them they've got to make sure and be firm in the back fingers. And just the minute you strike, I don't think I'm far enough here. The minute you strike the head, how quickly can you freeze the stick? Like that. As far as for, uh, for front ensemble and timpani and all that, yeah, I'm dealing with, you know, I, I, now I teach a college band that doesn't have that anymore. So that's been about four or five years since I've had to, to mess with that in an outdoor sense. But really, the stroke that we do on, on, on any eights, that's exactly what I'm telling all of my keyboardists and timpanists to do, all right, is that it is, you know, and I've seen this a lot with those of us that are in the marching realm that also teach in the concert realm, that that is one thing that just does not change. We may be playing a little bit heavier, um, but, uh, but from the standpoint of approach, I don't look at that any different, you know, for my keyboard players versus my bass drummers versus, you know, uh, the tenor drummers, you know, everything should be the same. Did I get both of those, Tracy? I don't think I did. What I did. Okay. Um, all right. So after we get done doing uh, variation one, two or three times at that tempo, then I will bump it up to 156 and we go back to all up. Okay. So. This is back to uh, the very first exercise, all up. Here we go, one, two. Depending on how much time we have, we may do that only twice. We may go faster if we do have more time, you know, lower the heights and everything. But then the very last thing we do when we get done with that is we go to the exact same exercise, except, and the section leader picks the tempo, and we just slow it down to nothing so that it's like this. And then we overplay to stretch out the muscles. So let's do it one time through, uh, very slow, but very high, and stretch it out. One, two, ready. And then that takes care of that. Now I'm looking up at the clock here and I see, oh my gosh, we've used 20 minutes already. But in the warm up exercise, because I feel so strongly about this, this is the most important thing that we do. After that, the hands should, you know, should be stretched out a little bit, should feel better. And then we barrel through these other things, a couple reps, and that's about it, you know, two or three reps. Um, all right, the seven, eight double B. I like this one because uh, A, it just takes out that last eighth note. You know, many of you have played the very generic double beat exercise. Well, it sounded cool because it's in seven, eight, and it took that much time out of it. You know, and again, I'm trying to shave every bit of time out of the, uh, out of the warm up that I can. So this one is the exact same double beat exercise that you're used to, but you leave off that last eighth note. So it sounds like this. And then we get into the threes and all that stuff. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we do mark time to it. And so that helps with the coordination as well, uh, because you're obviously marking time um, and then doing the double beat on the upbeat when you get to that. So let's run through this one kind of slow. We do this one at 132. Uh, we'll do it uh, slow first, and then we'll do it up to tempo. All right, here we go. One, two.
okay? And that takes care of double beat because what we've done now is we've done, you know, single notes with, a, with one hand. We've done uh, uh, two height with one hand, okay? And now we've gone into double beat, okay? Combine that, and we'll do that about three times through. Uh, oh, I wanted to do one other thing with that. Um, hey, Wayne, real, yeah, real, real quick, something related to this. Um, Seth Gray had a follow-up to his original question. He said, uh, so my assumption is you teach only two strokes up and down, not the full down tap up? Well, let's put it this way. Um, I'm not. If I ask a kid how to breathe, it's hard to answer that question. So, yeah, I do keep it simple. You're right. This stroke right here, I'm not talking about it much because, you know, they have to be able to get the stick up there again. So if they play the downstroke correctly, they play the, uh, or the low note correctly, they have to get it up. Yes, if I have um, a student that's having a real hard time with that, yeah, we will start talking about it, if that's what you're, if that's what the question is referring to. Um, yeah, I think it was, I think it was just the... Because you obviously do, all those things are in there. All of them are inherent in it. But I think it's the whole, like you said, you don't want to bog them down in right. too much information. And it's a little bit, you know, and I think you'll find this, or I found this, I'll just put it that way, with, um, with younger teachers versus older teachers. And I know Dawson and I have, have had uh, questions, uh, conversations about this. Younger teachers say a lot of things um, and there's nothing wrong with that you've got all this information you want your kids to understand it but you younger teachers who just were students yourself remember we know this as older teachers that you're only retaining about 60 percent of what we tell you they're doing the same thing when you start talking you know so keep it simple you know the whole uh kiss keep it simple stupid i've always you know tried to adhere to that so that yeah we will talk about that if a, a student really needs it. Uh, and I'm really glad that Brad just joined on after I started talking about his technique that he taught the uh, Cavaliers long ago. So if you're wondering who I just trashed, he's now here. Hey, how you doing? Okay, I did not trash you, sir. Um, okay, so we, uh, with the double beat, all right, we will do that at, uh, I better slow that down. Uh, we will do that at 132, and like I said, very we're very meticulous about keeping these things the same. We're not changing things up. Now, this might be something that only works for a college drum line, but I don't think so. I think if you're doing a high school band and you warm up exactly the same way every time, make sure that it's doing something for the show that you're, you're doing. Like we, when we get into uh, triplet rolls, we do triplet rolls at 160. We don't we don't do them at 132. We don't do them at 180, you know, except for fun sometimes. We do them at 160 because every time we get a fast tune uh, and, the, um, and we get the chart to write it, it's quarter note equals 156, quarter note equals 163. Well, what the band directors don't know, sorry, Doug, if you're ever watching this, is that I put it on 160 every single time. And, and because that's what we're used to playing. And we're so used to it now that when we actually try to play something at 156, we're falling forward. Uh, we've got that ingrained. And it just, it saves us a lot of time when we're teaching tunes for the marching band because, you know, OSU, kind of like Michigan State, not like UNA guys, uh, you know, we're doing five shows a year. And sometimes we're throwing a show together in, I don't know, six rehearsals, you know. Uh, and so that it gets to be tough after a while because we want to play challenging stuff. And so it has to be, you know, stuff that we can, uh, we can, you know, absorb quickly. And so we don't want to be learning, oh, these roles need to be at 152 instead. Um, okay, with the double beat now. So we do this at 132. Half of you, I don't know, doesn't matter which half, if you're, uh, uh, if the last number of your social security number is an odd number, what you're going to do is you're going to play the last two lines first. Okay. And this is what we do is we do this with the tenors. I'll just give this over to the tenor line. I don't know if any of my tenors are here right now, but know this for next year. Um, I'll do this. And what that means is that they, they're going to start with the three. Okay. Now we won't be able to hear this obviously because you're all, uh, um, uh, you're, you're all muted and everything. 
but then you get this, and I can't do it. Uh, Dr. Weber, if you can do it, you can unmute and do it for me. I can't do the three and the two simultaneously. Um, uh, I'm just not that good. <laughs> I'm not that smart. Um, but yeah, th what you get then is a um, is you get the two different sections, the tenors and the snares playing two different rhythms. And we also do something that I think is important. A lot of the drum lines that I've, or some of the drum lines that I've had didn't like this, some have. We always do mesh Monday, which means Monday, snares and the tenors mesh, kind of like if you remember Vanguard when they used to do double beat and, uh, uh, and things like that. They would have two snares and a tenor, two snares and a tenor and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it just, it, it helps with the listening. So for right now, seven, eight, we're gonna do the double beat and uh, half of you, all right, are gonna play what's written. The other half are gonna play uh, the changed pattern, okay? I'm just gonna play what's written. Here we go. You hear the two different pitches on my pad i would say it's because of having two different pitch sticks no it's because this hand is old that's why <laughs> so i'm not getting the same sound go ahead so another question from ryan carlson okay. um is i noticed in the old front ensemble packets back when osu had one <laughs> um that you had them play double beat on the keyboards. What is your thought on them warming up with doubles when front ensembles are 99.9% of the time not playing doubles in their music? Yeah, I would, I mean, if we had a, um, if we had a front ensemble, I would probably change that because that's, you know, old school. It was really, you know, the reason I had it in there you know, because, yeah, they would play da dun da dun da dun da dun da da dun da dun da dun da dun da and go through a progression, and a harmonic progression. And the reason was is because there's so many students there in the front ensemble that were music majors in their first year. They had a desire to play in the battery. They weren't quite ready for it yet. Putting them in the front ensemble gave them seven hours a week of playing on an instrument that they just haven't played that much on. And so, A, educationally, it was extremely sound, but then B, that, you know, for that particular question, that did get them a little bit of technique in that, even though, yeah, you're not getting the, the bounce on a, you know, a set of vibes and things like that. But yeah, anymore, if I had that coming in, because, you know, I've had a lot of really good keyboard players that just, since we don't have the keyboards anymore, uh, we'll end up playing a different instrument, um, either bass drum, and a lot of times just they'll be in the cymbal line. Um, but if they, yeah, if I had strong keyboard players, then we would probably do some sort of 16th bass exercise, uh, you know, cross scales or something like that. You know, which work. So, yeah, I know. We, we've we used like green scales type things and stuff like that and that same situation. Okay, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's probably what I would do. Uh, Okay, and that leads us then into stick control, which to me, this is the most important exercise ever written. I mean, I don't think I have that sheet. No, I don't have it out. I just did a, uh, we had a virtual music camp and I showed the first page of Stone Stick Control to everybody. And it's really sad, not a single person knew what that was from. Uh, and that is sad because even, uh, knowing, you know, looking at it and seeing the patterns go, well, that looks an awful lot like an exercise that I play in, in, in marching band called stick control. It's like, yeah, and believe it or not, that's the name of the book. So, um, you know, this exercise to me is, is probably the most important because now you're taking single notes, double notes, triple notes, and four notes and combining them into one exercise. Um, and I know you've all played something like this before. The pattern here is two beats of check and then two beats of right, 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 left. Two beats of check, right, left, left, left. Two beats of check, four. And then two beats of check, two. And for those of you that watch Dr. Weber's um, uh, clinic, 
did the exact same exercise. Uh, I'm gonna show you something uh, on this exercise that'll be helpful again for a full band setting uh, in just a second. But let's go ahead and do this one. This one we slow down a little bit to about 128 because we just felt that 132 was really kind of almost making us tight and not loosening up. And we wanted to go fast enough that we're you know, gaining the finger control you know, that, that you need. Um, and this is also, you know, this kind of negates, if you do stick control, it kind of negates the reason, you know, you can do it when you're training and all that, but when you're warming up and you're doing seven, eight, you've probably uh, seen sometimes where, okay, fill it in now. You know, that kind of negates that need because you're doing, you know, that within this exercise. Okay, so stick control, you've all done it. Um, let's add uh, eight on a hand before that. So eight right, eight left, and then play the exercise that you see. Okay, here we go. Oh, well, I know you've probably already done this. You have that backbeat rhythm on the second line. And then you do the exact same pattern, but no check anymore. All right. Um, but I, like I said, I think most of you have done this. All right, here we go. Remember, uh, two bars of eights. One, two, one, two, ready, and. All right, sorry for my left hand giving out. It happens. Um, okay. Now, here's what I was going to tell you. We'll do that one like twice through, all right? What I was going to tell you is if you do the eights at the beginning, and then after that last bar, what we've done, uh, and I need to notate this. I just haven't. As you can tell, we've been doing these exercises for a while because it says 2013 at the top. We will add one measure of sixteenths in an inverted roll sticking. Like that. Uh, a, it helps your open rolls with the control. The whole reason that was designed is that if you play that exercise with the eights in front and the added bar at the end, if you've ever had to do a uh, box eight to the right or box eight to the left in marching band basics, that exercise fits that perfectly. Um, and that's the whole reason we did it is that we, we were doing these box eights with just people doing taps or doing eight on a hand or something like that. And we realized, well, we can do something just a little bit more useful to us and so we just do stick control over and over again doing that. So if that's something that you do in your band, that's an easy one to, to add in there. Okay. Uh, next page. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, this uh, exercise, I love this exercise. It was developed by Dan. You'll see right there it says Dan Poulter Jr. I got his permission just this afternoon to use it uh, since this is going up on YouTube and everything. Um, I love this exercise because it is quick and to the point with the triplet rolls. It kind of gets you started with the right hand only doing the diddles and then the left hand only doing the diddles in the second line. Um, and then the, the pattern that he does in the last, for the two height. Okay, so you've got your rolls all up. And so on. And then you get to the two height in the last two lines and you have, well, I just love the pattern that he wrote. I also, it's just, talk about, you know, small world, uh, drumming world, and sorry, this is probably only interesting to me, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Dan Poulter Jr., uh, he marched in the Blue Coats. He was, I believe he tapped at Michigan State for a year, um, uh, in maybe 2010 or something like that. Uh, his dad was my section leader when I was a freshman at Michigan State. And so I just, you know, to meet him and to see how good he was and everything was just amazing to me because his dad was the first person that I, you know, became acquainted with at MSU when I was just young and dumb. Um, anyway, so we'll do this one and we'll do it like two or three times through and that's it. Because of the fact that it covers, in my opinion, all the basics, all the basic patterns that we're going to have in our show. You know, is it a tap roll? Is it a five stroke roll? Is it single diddles? You know, it's got it all. And, uh, and then for the two height, uh, same type of thing. It's talking about, or, or it's, it's emphasizing, can you do rolls at three inches, okay? Oh, plus 
two more. Um, the thing about this in, in my teaching is that I used to do three different heights, which got really confusing because when you got to rolls and all that stuff, taps were at three inches or two inches, rolls were at six and your accents were up and oh, that was a mess. And thank goodness now, and I think most people have kind of subscribed to this, it's just when you do too high, the rolls are down at the same level as your taps. Um, and so that's the way we do this. Uh, this one's a little bit harder to read. Uh, you can probably do the first three lines. So let's do that. Uh, ooh, not at 180. You can tell I took a beta blocker so that I could, you know, speak slowly. It's not working. All right. So this is the uh, this is the tempo that, like I said before, we always do it at 160 because that's whenever we do triplet rolls, that's pretty much what we're going to be at. All right. So let's do the first three lines. Again, you're pretty, it's pretty basic. You, you've probably played a million different variations of triplet rolls. Here's yet another one. I just like the way it's laid out because of the fact that that doesn't take much time and you've gone through all the, the, the patterns that you may need. Um, then we get to the two height. I'll, I'll let you know that the, you know, the confusing part is that fourth bar. Uh, what is it? Measure, measure 16. At that low uh, level and at that tempo, you know, you've got to really have control over the fingers. Uh, if you look at uh, the last two bars of that second from the last line. All right, that is the one part that we always have a little bit of problem. Somebody throws in an extra diddle or something like that. Um, this is quick sight reading, but you know, this is recorded so you can go back and do it again. Please don't slow, <laughs> I say this and now you'll do it. Don't slow down YouTube and listen to the quality of my rolls. Thank you very much. Okay, here we go. All the way through from the beginning. And I can also tell you from years of experience, and I don't know if John Weber would agree with this or not, the last line always slows down. All right, the, the, the members have got to practice that with the Met, and I may have overdone it because of the fact that I know that it always slows down, you know, to keep that moving. Uh, Tracy, anything right now? Okay. Um, like I said, we'll do that about three times through, uh, and that will take care of our... Um, and that'll take care of all of our triplet rolls. Then we move into CVAC. Again, if we had, uh, if, if everybody had their audio on, I would ask what that is. I'll, I'll look at uh, Brad right now since I can see you. Do you have any idea what that word means? <laughs> CVAC. Uh, oh, yeah, I think I can guess. Okay. It's cavies backwards, <laughs> all right? Um, there's an exercise that uh, when I marched in the Cavaliers, and it was my favorite exercise. Now, granted, it was in 1980, but um, you've pro a lot of you have probably played it before, where it's a very basic, uh, you know, dealing with tap drags. Okay, and so on and so forth. Well, I just took this and I... I don't want to say modernize it, but I made it so that it, it had a lot more variation for things that we would do in our uh, in our shows. It's got Hertas thrown in there, a couple of them. Single nine, because we have dirty single nines all through our street beat. No offense, OSU, but yeah, they're dirty every time we play them. Um, not every time. Last year was, was a pretty good year for that. Anyway, so this one will be a, a tough one to do... Um, with uh, uh, with just reading, 
and so let me just for right now before we go through it and you can play through it with me we'll do it two bars at a time okay uh, and it's uh, and I'll, I'll explain a couple other things uh, as we go but first thing is first a uh, couple bars all right one two ready and Okay, so you got a lot of left accents in that first measure, and the whole purpose of that, because I, I really was a little bit maybe too, uh, I, I got too much into the, the thought of all of this, that was because I had trouble with students slurring their roles, which, uh, you know, and, and my best friend Brad and I will, will remember this all too well, uh, you do tap rolls. And that first left diddle is basically a triplet. You know, there's no gap or anything. Well, there's a lot of that that happens with the right hand. And this one, if you're not careful, you know, it can come out completely slurred. So it forces the students to make sure and feel that, you know, as truly to get it da -da, like that. Um, all right, and then you've got uh, measure three and measure four. All right, a, a more normal tap pattern or tap drag. Okay, tap drag and then two hertas. And then some six stroke rolls, which again, we will talk about gapping the rolls so you don't get this. Okay, you've got to make sure and put a gap between the accent and the, and the diddle. Okay, then I like to write uh, a lot of accented diddles, which is probably a, a sin, but uh, that's what's in measure five and measure six then. Okay, because I, I write those patterns a lot. And then that's just the measure uh, six is just a group of fives right there. And then seven, we'll just keep going on this. Seven is your very generic and we have stuff like this all over the place. If you buy any stock tune, it's gonna be in there. And then it ends with two hertas and then into a single nine. And that's because in our series, we have a couple of single nines in there and we just in the warm up, you know, process, we wanna make sure we're doing that. We'll do this one only twice through, all right? And it's always at 120. And the reason it's always at 120 is because our series is at 120. We don't want to vary from that. Oops. Whoa, wow. There we go. All right, so let's try this one. One. So we'll do that one a couple of times through and we'll uh, uh, and that gets us our duple bass rolls. Uh, why do we start with the triple bass rolls? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I, I won't you know try to make something up. Uh, it's just the way that we've always done it. We'll, we'll you know dive into the triple bass rolls probably because we used to do them a little bit slower. But now like I said we just we barrel at 160, do it two or three times through. We do CVAC two or three times through, usually just two. And that's it. Uh, SCV3s we don't do anymore. It's an exercise you're probably familiar with. Porgy and Bess, I, I, left it, I left this here mostly because I didn't have time to erase it. But um, if you ever wanted to use this, this is old. I mean, I literally, you can see the date there. I wrote it in 1989. And that's because we did have a pit. I wanted the pit to play the excerpt from Porgy and Bess. And so you've got nine or 12 people all going And I'm sure Dr. Wiggins and Dr. Weber had to play this. And uh, we don't do it anymore uh, because of the fact that we don't have a front ensemble. We've got flams in other uh, exercises and it's the one that's below this. And so we just don't do this one anymore. But I left it there just so you could see, oh yeah, I can hear Porgy and Bess, to check it, 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 and so on and so forth. Okay. Monkey bulls is monkey beat and flammables combined into one exercise. All right. 
Uh, Monkey Beat, I believe, was developed by uh, probably Tom uh, Tom Hannum, I think. I'm not positive. And then Flammables, also known as Flambo, I think was a Marty Hurley thing. I don't know if there was somebody before that, but both of these are old, old exercises that we just, you know, th there, there's a purpose for them. It, it goes through all the patterns of flams that you would need. And then when you get into the second half, it starts adding some Swiss in there and then combining uh, patties and flam taps. All right. But I think a lot of you have probably played this. We also do this one at 120 because this is gearing us up to play the series or any kind of duple stuff that's at, at 120. All right. Um, another reason or another thing we do with this, check the time. Okay. Another thing we do this, this is we always start with a check pattern of low inner beats. And that is so that you're setting up your heights for the inner beats when you get into the flams. Okay. Uh, this one's a fun one to play. Uh, we do this a lot in the stands because the tenor part and the bass part that exists has, you know, um, contrasting rhythms and it creates a lot of hocket. And so it just sounds cool. And so that's why we'll do the, the we'll do this one in the stands quite a bit as just stand ram to, to play. Um, let's go ahead and do just the first half. You've probably been looking through it already, uh, but up to the, the measure rest that you have there and start with a measure of low sixteenths. Here we go. One. And then I think, I don't know if it was during Tracy's era or not, but um, I don't do egg beaters. Uh, I, I, I used to write them. If you don't know what egg beaters are, that's a 3-2-3-2 three, two, three, two pattern. All right. Lots of Cavaliers lines played that. I'm sure Brad has taught that more times than he wants to remember. That was um, literally the snare break at Freelancers when I marched. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And so... I just, I, I needed things to be mathematically correct. And so it's, uh, I don't know who called it Wayne beaters, but I, it's, it's not, but that's around here. That's what they always call them because it's like, well, they're not egg beaters. So they must be Wayne beaters. Um, and all it is, is you're doing six tuplets. And instead of doing a double with your left hand at the end, you do a single note. All right. And if you've done this exercise before, it's probably in there that way, uh, I would assume. But we have that in our series as well. So that's why that is there, all right, in the, in the process. Uh, I'm going to push through this just a little bit more. Um, and then when we get to the second half, this is where you get to uh, flammables, or if you grew up in the south in Louisiana, it was called flambo, uh, B-E-A-U-X-E-X-U-E-X. -E 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 I don't, I can't do that Cajun stuff. Um, but uh, again, one that we do quite a bit because it does add in the Swiss. And when we, and we'll do this one a couple times through also. And when we get done with that, uh, we're pretty much done. We'll play through this uh, in just a second. We're pretty much done. Let me make sure. Yeah, we're pretty much done with the short exercises. And we've covered everything. We've got flam drags. Um, we don't have any cheese uh, rudiments. That's what comes next uh, that we'll talk about. Um, and, uh, uh, and like I said, we've covered pretty much everything we need to, uh, except for threes, I think. I mean, you've got the threes here, uh, but again, that is something that comes in the next uh, in the next exercise. It's longer. Uh, anyway, let's play this one um, about 120, and remember, start with a measure of sixteenths. Here we go. Thank you. 
Okay, so to review very quickly, and then there's probably maybe some questions, I don't know. We'll do volume six all up three times, twice at 132, once at 144. Then uh, volume six all down, one time through, uh, piano. Then very, and we, we're still at 144. Then we do a variation one. We'll do that a couple of times through usually at 144. If we're feeling like we you know, need to work on you know, uh, quicker tempos, we, we may bump it up to 156, but usually two times through at 144. Then 156, uh, it's, uh, we'll take it all up and do it a couple of times and then do it once through with uh, you know, very, very slow, okay? Double beat three times through. With the third time, the tenor switching to starting with the threes instead of the twos. Stick control two times through at 128. Uh, double beat was at 132. Um, come on. Dirt diddles, all right, triplet rolls. We will do usually three times through to make sure that we're warmed up there, all at 160. CVAC, usually twice through at 120. We don't do that one. And then monkey bulls will do twice through at 120. When that's done, we could go and be with the, with, with the winds and we've taken up about five, six minutes and that's it. And we usually feel pretty good. We're, you know, we're not tight. Uh, some people may have to come in and, and you know, just do a little bit of this before we get started. But for the most part, you know, and, and now that I have uh, band director chops, yeah, I don't want to be playing for 20 minutes to get warmed up. So boom, we just, I go through this uh, quite a bit. Um, then we start to do, and I know that, that a lot of college drum lines have the, the show off warmups. All right. And what we have, and it's just called the big four. And so it's Blue Martian drumming the series. And what that means is we'll do Blue Light Special, which is something that I wrote. I'll explain that in a second, uh, right here. And then Martian Mambo, which I don't have in here because that's copyrighted and you can buy that at tapspace.com. Give them an ad. Then we do uh, Steve uh, uh, Double Beat, but the Vanguard Double Beat uh, uh, from uh, Steve Reich. And, uh, and that's another Tapspace one that you can buy. And then we'll end with a series, which is our street beat that I wrote. Uh, it says 1995. It actually began, portions of this began in like 1990 or maybe even 89. No, 1990. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been around for a while now. Not as long as the Michigan State series, but it's, it's been around long enough. Um, and, uh, and anyway, if we did all of that, it would probably take about 10 minutes. Um, but... We've been through everything. Now that is without stopping, without stopping and correcting something like, oh boy, we crap that roll out, cut it off, start it over again. But if things go well, yeah, it can be, you can get done with all of that in about 10 minutes, which is the whole point of why, you know, this came about. I didn't sit down and develop this system. It just came about. And I talked to the drumline members about this a couple of years ago and I said, man, are you guys getting bored with this? Well, Something you have to remember, and, and I learned this early on, uh, when you get bored teaching something, you got to remember you're the only one bored with it. It's new to every person that comes in. Um, you know, I stopped teaching C refractions for a little while and yell after the rain because, oh, God, they yell after the rain. Oh, my goodness me. But there is so much stuff that's useful in that piece that if you don't learn it, you're missing something. Um, and my apologies to Rich Bonner who was the first guy that I experimented with not doing all that normal stuff, you know, no, wrong, wrong, should never have done that. Um, and so I, with these exercises, I asked the guys, I said, now, do you get tired of this? You know, and, you know, the freshmen are like, well, I, it's all new to me. So no, I'm not tired of it. The sophomores are like, man, I just learned this. Don't change things around. The juniors are like, well, we can finally play it well. So please don't change it. And the seniors are like, I'm too tired to learn something new. So we just go through and yeah, it's been the same ever since. Um, and, you know, the people haven't, you know, if, if they're complaining about it, they haven't complained about it to me. Uh, if I do make any big changes, it would be this year, uh, which I'm probably not gonna because of the fact that we have a very large freshman class. I graduated so many people last year. I mean, that's a good thing, I know, but we graduated so many people that, um, yeah, we had four returning snares and four returning bass drums, and that's it. So we've got a lot of rookies. So if that's the first time you're hearing that, rookies from uh, OSU realize that you have a lot of people in the exact same class. Um, okay, 
Is there any questions? I had one more quick thing, Tracy, because I ran out of time to talk about Blue Light. I'll leave it up. No, you can you can talk about it. We we can go a little bit longer. Most okay. of these have gone about an hour and a half. So. Okay. Well, I'm hungry, so. <laughs> yeah, if you want to talk through like kind of how it's constructed and stuff, that would be cool. Okay. Well, first thing I was going to do is something that I learned uh, early on, and this was during. Uh, uh, well, it's a little bit before John and Tracy's time, Dr. Weber and Dr. Wiggins' time. Sorry, guys. Um, I was so blessed uh, being at Michigan State, going through a time where the drum line, and, and, and I have to get a lot of credit to, you know, my compadre, uh, Brad Halls. You know, he and I were teaching that drum line for, for a long time. I was a grad student. He decided he needed to go and march at the Blue Devils. And because of the fact that back then, and guys, you'll be amazed by this. I don't know if you've heard the stories, but both Dr. Weber and Brad Halls had to stop going to school because they made you move out there January 1 so you could be there for weekly sectionals. Uh, so you were either a local person or you didn't go to school and you moved out there back in January. Um, I'm really pleased that that doesn't happen anymore because that's a little bit overkill for sure. Um, and we don't seem to be suffering from it because the drum lines today play so much better than we did back then. But um, anyway, uh, the, um, oh, sorry about that. Um, I forgot where I was going with all this. Oh, the, uh, the guy that I was teaching, sorry. <laughs> Tra you can't see him, but Tracy's laughing at me. Um, the guy that I was teaching uh, who later became the announcer for the OSU marching band, could not play an open role. You know, in fact, I was so blessed being at MSU with all those guys, and then that's where I was going. Sorry, and then I got sidetracked. I came to OSU, and no offense to all of you that are watching that are from the 1987 drumline, but there wasn't a single person that knew or could play an open role. And I thought, oh, man, I got a lot of teaching to do, and I wasn't prepared for that. And so it was a little frustrating because, you know, if you do your YouTube searching and you search for the 1986 drumline at Michigan State, that's the last drumline that I taught. And you can search for the 1987 OSU drumline, but you're not going to find anything. Um, and it's because they just they didn't have an instructor. I was the first instructor that they had. So um, I learned the hard way about this guy can't do an overall. And you probably had students that do this where you're playing along and say, okay, well play your, your basic hug a dig a burr or chicken and a roll, whatever you want to call it. And the roll quality comes out like this. Okay. Well, slow it down and, and stroke it out more. And that's the sound that comes out. You're going to have a lot of people that do that because it, this, is not a natural motion that, that people are born with. You've got to teach them how to do that. So I'm like, okay, well, I got to figure out a way to, to teach this. And so we'll, we'll play a little bit here just so you can see what, what to go through. And like I said, for educational purposes, this is for the students that just can't do an open roll. So right now we're just going to do eight on a hand. Okay, so pick up the sticks again. Uh, eight on a hand, we're going to go pretty quick. One, two, and one, two, ready, and. And then you take it a little bit faster, you know, however fast a student can play it, because this is a one on one type of thing. So one, two, one, two, ready, and. Now that particular student isn't going to be able to go that fast. You guys all pretty much can. Then, okay, move it to six on a hand. One, two, six on a hand, two, ready, and. And again, one, two, one, two, ready, and. on a hand. One, two, one, two, ready, and. One, two, one, two, ready, and. Three on a hand. One, two, one, two, ready, and. One, two, one, two, ready, and. Two on a hand. One, two, one, two, ready, and. At that point, and it, you, you should see, I mean, I've done this so many times and it's a joy every single time it happens. All of a sudden, 
that kid just did a nine stroke roll and had no idea how they did it because I tell them it's not an open roll. It's two on a hand, you know, do it that way. And then you add the check pattern before that. Now it's tough because their brain has been ingrained with, you know, for their rolls, you know, I, I throw the stick and I hope it bounces right. So you have to tell them, okay, loosen up and play two on a hand. And that is, that has been a godsend for me to, to discover that. And, and it wouldn't have happened because, like I said, I was so spoiled working with, uh, it was, it was great, but it was kind of almost, you know, unfair. The experience that I got at, at Michigan State, you know, we didn't have an instructor. So Brad and I were in the line and teaching. Well, here's a guy from Phantom Regiment. Here's a guy from Blue Devils. These two marched in Star of Indiana. This guy was in the Bridgman for a while. And, you know, you look at that. We did, I, I don't know if the photo still exists, but we did a photo one time where everybody brought their drum corps jackets in. And it was just amazing to look at because it was well over half the drum line, I think, that, that had that. Well, and that was great. Well, then I got down and I actually had to do some real teaching. Again, I apologize to the 87 drum line, but they taught me an awful lot about, okay, what do I have to do to make it so that you understand what I'm trying to teach you? Uh, Dr. Wiggins? Yeah, I seem to remember there being a story about it being so dire that you actually tried to pay them to be able oh, to I play did. a role. Absolutely, yeah. They, uh, it was one of those, you know, I, we were doing like a Western show. Imagine that at OSU, doing a Western show. And so they had this company front and they're pushing forward, you know, and, you know, just a slow roll that we all pretty much take for granted now. And of course, it was like, and I said, I will pay you, you know, Five dollars each if you just play that role clean. Um, I also, I will go ahead and admit this, you know, for the world to hear. I also had a little trouble, and this is something that you guys uh, that go out and teach, you've got to remember the environment you're in. So I'm teaching drum corps. I marched drum corps for two years. I taught it for, I don't know, nine or something. Um, and I got to OSU, and, you know, they they didn't know what I was trying to get across to them, you know? So I was three years from removed from, from marching with Phantom Regiment. I was obviously one, you know, months removed from being at Michigan State. And, you know, all of a sudden, and again, apologies to the tenor line of that year, they're coming forward during this, this company front and they're just looking all over the place. And, you know, we rehearsed in the morning and I've got my long ranger and everything and they cut off and I go, don't worry, I won't do it. I go, quads, what in the F are you guys looking at? And it just echoes around all of Stillwater, you know, and I'm in the middle of the Bible Belt. <laughs> and that's what, that's, uh, you know, the, the head band director, Bill Ballinger, he just turned off his mic and he says, oh my God. <laughs> and so, yeah, you got to remember where you are. Um, you, you know, if you're teaching a high school line, you're working with people that have been teaching for a while, you know, your, your band directors. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Wiggins, if there's a lot of schools around your area where your guys get to go and teach, uh, you know, while they're in school. Yeah, like especially during the summer, during band camp, we actually have more schools wanting them than we can fill the slots okay. out. Right, and we're in a little bit of a, of a uh, you know, rural area. So people got to drive quite a ways to do that, but they'll do it so they can teach. And so we've had people, I, one guy that's on here taught at Ponca City. That's 50 miles straight north. We've had a lot of people. Uh, Tracy, did you ever teach at Enid? Were you one of the many Enid people? No, that was John. That was John. <laughs> well, and John Robinson. And then after you guys, we had a whole Tom. bunch of uh, people, Josh White, uh, uh, people that went off and taught over in Enid. And so there's been people there forever. Dr. Weber, did you have something to add? Tom. And Oh, Tom did? Yeah, Tom McGillan did as well. Anyway, we've had so many people go out and teach. Well, you've got to remember, if you've marched drum corps before, you're not teaching a drum corps. You're teaching a high school drum line. Uh, and if you've been in, involved with your college drum line, you got to remember these kids are 14, not 21. Uh, your language has to change. Your demeanor has to change. Um, you know, you can't, I, I, oh gosh, it's just, you know, luckily it hasn't been very many of my students, uh, 
if any at all. But I do remember there was a guy that was teaching at um, a school in the area and he would, you know, show up at a morning rehearsal still with, you know, some of the evening activities on his breath. Um, you can't do that. You know, that, the, the, you only get one chance uh, to, you know, especially in this day and age, you only get one chance to, to make your mark. And it only takes one mistake to remove yourself completely from, from, that, entire, from that entire life, you know, if you make a, a mistake big enough. So, you know, do remember when you go out and teach, you know, you are a rep representative of your school, but more so you're just a representative of yourself. And you can't be, you can't look at, oh, I'm going to be the cool guy that stands out in front of the drum line. Not, not anymore. Those, those days are past. Um, okay. Uh, Dr. Wiggins, any other questions or anything you want to throw in? We don't have any more questions right now. Did you want to talk kind of through the, how you put blue light together? Okay. Thank you. Um, you're keeping me on task, aren't you? Cause I said I was going to do that. Eh, you're good. Um, okay. So the beginning of this exercise, since I have it up here is, um, exercise, I think it was probably Madison Scouts. I, I really don't know where this was developed, but it's a slow, you know, a six, eight or 12, eight double beat exercise. And I'm sure a lot of you have played some kind of variation of this at some point in time. So, um, you know, when you do the switch to the other hand, you're just doing an inverted paradiddle, you know, a diddle para, or that's actually a rudiment. Uh, come on, Wayne. What's it? Uh, don't look it up, Dr. Wiggins. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, shoot. It's the one that we never do. Um, yeah, well, it'll come later to me. Um, but it is. When I, I know on the chart. I can see it right there. It's a, uh, yeah, we don't do that one. I think it has a flam on it, maybe. Anyway, um, you start with the diddle on the switch over. And that switches you over to the left hand. Okay, so let's do from the beginning up to 15. Because that takes you through the generic exercise. Beginning through 15. One, two, one, two, ready, and. And then it starts going into a lot more grid stuff. Now I do a lot of uh, left hand triplet paddas, so I put this in. And the whole purpose of this exercise, uh, 2004, yeah, the whole purpose of this exercise was to do all of the licks that I write a lot, so that when I write a halftime show, oh yeah, that's okay. We do that in blue light, you know, and it's so that it covers a lot of the things that, that Wayne does. So it's, this one's very unique to OSU, you know, how good it would really be for anybody else. It's only if you like the stuff that's in there. Um, but then we do the, the left hand putt it does. And another single nine, because we need the practice at it every, every chance we get. All right. So let's do 15 and 16. One, two, one, two, ready. And And that takes care of that. Um, again, we can't do a question and answer, but I bet 90% of you would understand what 17 is. And all that is, is a flam accent, one, you know, breakdown one hand at a time. If you've ever done any flam rudiments and you have trouble with them, just figure out what each hand does. I think, uh, I think some of the other clinicians have done this already. You know, but if you're doing regular flam taps and you're, you know, or uh, flam accents, sorry. And you're having trouble keeping the inner beats even and all that stuff, just find out what each hand does. And so this is just a variation of that. Then we go into the grid stuff, all right? So if you're looking at 21, you've got four flam accents, six flam taps, and then we do two flam drags, two flam cheese, or flam stutter if you are above the age of 50, um, and then two flam fives, all right? And it all fits so that it starts with the right hand within the 12-8 context. So 
Uh, at 21, it sounds like this. All right, so you got your two flam drags, two flam stutters, and then two flam fives. Sorry, I just went to old man again, two flam cheese. Um, so let's play that. All right, starting at 21, four bars worth. All right, one, two, one, two, ready, and. Okay, now this is where we do a lot of our hair toe work. Um, you know, when we get to measure 25. Uh, so you got two flam accents, two hair toes. And then, uh, you know, to do the, the left hand accent, or I guess it's grandma's, I don't know if that's what it's called or not. Um, but then we do, I, I've written this a lot. I mean, beginning with Stillwater High School back in like the 90s. Um, ooh, sorry about that. So that's that we're working your hair toes on those two bars. Let's play those two. One, two, one, two. Okay, then we still, we go into inverts. All right, so we can do those two bars. One, two, three, and. After that, diminuendo triplets, and then it's, this is a written out Excel roll that Wayne has written so many times, it's, it's gross. So I figured, okay, we're just gonna put this in the exercise. Okay, sorry for that. Um, and, um, uh, so, and like I said, that's one that is just, it's unique to, to what we do a bunch of. And so I write a lot of roles that will change, you know, meter and feel. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so if we go back and that's, and we have a two measure rest there, go back to 21. We can go through this whole thing, uh, which is basically the grid section. One, two, 21, one, two. Then a two measure rest, which is a tenor break. Um, and then a couple of things. Uh, I, I tended to write uh, this pattern with doing um, in, inverted roll sticking. Okay, so I just did two paradiddle diddles and then into that sticking. And we're back into the triplets again. So two paradiddle diddles and then dun, 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 like that. Okay, do that. One, two. One, two, ready, and. And now uh, a bunch of chichetas and uh, uh, single hand patties uh, right here. Oh, sorry. All right, so you're doing chichetas with singles and then single hand patties with two flams and then a couple with three flams. Uh, after that, we're doing some fast paradiddle diddles that I do. I wrote, I write the paradiddle diddle way too much in all of my writing. Uh, it is my, you know, Tracy's smiling because he's played more of those than he wants to remember. Um, but yeah, if we start at uh, 35, this is what you're going to hear. Okay, so let's try that if you've been reading through it. One, two. And the ending. Uh, I won't go into this into a lot of detail. I will tell you that the triangles are back stick, and when the note head is on a different space, that's a, a different drum. So, and then, oh, the triangles uh, in the second beat, if it slopes in like this, you bring the stick in towards you. If it slopes out, you go away, and then you're hitting the drum to your right. Okay? So this one is gonna sound. And that's the way it ends. Now I'm gonna change this ending because through the years, this has remained dirty, which means it is a written error because it's just too many, you know, over and over again. 
So I'm going to put a little break in there and we're going to do, uh, do something a little different. Um, and for the real quick for the OSU guys that are watching, what I'm thinking is it's going to sound like this. And that'll be the new ending. So you can watch that later. Is that okay, Fatty? Can we do that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm going to do some other changes. It needs to be updated. Uh, the tenor part, one bad thing, if you're a snare drummer, everybody, sorry, I'm looking over here at the windows and not at the camera. Um, if you're a snare drummer, the thing that you're going to be most frustrated with is writing tenor parts that make any sense whatsoever. Um, and these made sense, but they're they're outdated because I'm doing all of the chachadas and all that between the drums. Cha -cha 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 -cha. I don't ever write that. You know, I was basically voicing out the snare part. So I'm going to do a lot of changes there so that they can do stuff that's more practical for the tenors. But yeah, that's what I would suggest to everybody is if you have, you know, when you develop a writing style, figure out what kinds of things you like and then put them all down into one exercise and it will save you so much time uh, in the, you know, in the span or in the time that you're teaching, because all of a sudden, all the things that you are making them do are there in an exercise. Uh, you know, if you've got common licks that you tend to write a lot of, well, make an exercise full of them. So you're saying basically like develop, you know, we talk about developing a vocabulary with like the rudiments and stuff like that. You're, you're kind of developing their vocabulary of like what the licks are too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, and they, they always call me, just call them Wayne Licks. And it's like, oh, yeah, there's another one. Oh, yeah, yeah there's another one. So, um, so that's what this was. And like I said, I, I need to update it um, and, uh, and everything. They, they wanted to update it last year to, I, I don't think there's any bets on here. They wanted to update it last year. But what they did is they just took the uh, snare break from Vanguard and just threw it in there from last year. And I said, yeah, let's not do that, guys. Let's try to make something that's ours. <laughs> Well, but I think that makes sense too because that that puts the vocabulary that you play on a regular basis into the warm up. Yeah. So it's kind of one thing that we talked a lot about with Derek Shannon last week was how to like cross over what you're doing in the technique program mm -hmm. into the actual like literature and stuff like that. And I think right. doing something like this is a very logical way of doing that. Well, and we and I'm very guilty of this is I, I hear a new exercise. Ooh, I want to play that. You know, I, I, that was really cool when blue Knights did this. And so I'll bring it back. I'll add it in, but it doesn't do us any good because it's not what we're going to play, you know, it, it, on a regular basis. So, um, you know, with what we've, uh, with, with what we've developed here, it works for us. And so I'm not saying to do this, although, I mean, it's all out there, you know, it's, it's on our website for, for you to download. Uh, I don't, you know, worry about, uh, anything on blue light special because, um, I want people to actually learn that, uh, it's a fun exercise. That was the one I was going to cut out when, you know, we started getting, we started doing Diddy. We had this thing, um, NJZ, which was an Adboisha, uh, uh, Zivkovich. Zip, yes, number number nine out of the funny room, I think. Is that right? Anyway, uh, we were doing that, and so I wanted an exercise for the keyboards, and I love that that solo, and it worked very well. Boom, 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 boom. And Tom McGillan wrote this this drum part for it. Well, now we had the big six, and we had you know the warm up was taking on you know way too much of its own. Uh, you know, it was becoming only the warm up. And the first one I was going to cut out was this because, yes, it, it's very practical, but it doesn't have the same groove like all these others did. They didn't want to do it because it made their hands feel good. You know, it, whenever I ask them, you know, okay, we don't have enough time. We can do one big piece, you know, one big warm up. It's either blue light or Martian. Uh, double beat, you know, tightens up your right arm too much. And um, well, and the other one is a series. Uh, and then Diddy, we did, we only did it the one year. We didn't do it real great. And it kind of, uh, it kind of died a, a, a quick death uh, here. Um, and if they, you know, people ever want to bring that back, uh, you know, I, I remember talking to the uh, composer and he said, no problem, use it at will. So we can if we want to. All right, anything else, sir? Uh, do we have any questions from anybody that's in here in the chat right now? I haven't been able to see you guys. 
Yeah. There you go. Anyone? No, they're they're uh they're drummed out from the past six sessions you've had. Yeah. Yeah, that's good for them. Are um, you uh are they required to attend these? If they if they can, we try to get them to. Um, just because with like summer work schedules and stuff like that, they're sort of at the mercy of bosses and things like that. Well, so. I've never seen Truman miss one, so make sure he's not getting A's. <laughs> if he's not getting A's all the time, give him one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm seeing if there's any other questions on the chats. Okay, so do you... Uh, a couple of questions to wrap up here. What would be your biggest piece of advice for somebody that was going to go out and be starting to teach drum lines? Uh, like going to do a high school? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, it's what I just talked about today. The exercise program is the most important thing, I think, that you can, that you can develop. You have to be smart about it. You know, I, I, I've kind of gone through already why we do what we do, doing, you know, one hand at a time, all up, and then double beat, and then two hands with uh, stick control and all that. It's very logical project, pro yeah, progression. And make sure that, that, you know, it makes sense to you as, as a teacher. Well, I want to uh, make sure that my guys can play. And the number one area you're going to do, and I don't know if, if John will remember back then to this, is do make sure that you're not trying to do too much. Don't make it too hard right at the beginning because I did that. You know, I went down to OSU and I'm thinking, I'm teaching at a college drum line. Boom, here's all the stuff I want to do. Why? You can't play open roles. You know, so you take a step back. You've got to go in and know who you're teaching, know what their limits are, and your, import, the, your most important job is not you. Your most important job is them, you know, or, or, or focus, I should say. You know, what is it that they need? Because you probably have the tools to give it to them, but we get caught up in uh, the, I'm now standing in front of a drum line. I'm doing what my uh, teacher, um, you know, did. And I, I can't wait to get doing it again. Um, you know, uh, uh, Jackson Lorden, you can't teach the same way at a high school that your high school teacher did because it works for him. All right. And uh, Dr. Weber marched with that man at uh, uh, back in Tulsa Union to, to talk about a small world. Dr. Weber, um, you know, his uh, uh, Donald is his high school drum teacher and uh, and Donald is very good at what he does. But Donald definitely uh, has a way with you guys that might not work in every situation <laughs> as, as he smiles. Okay. Um, uh, and I've made the mistake. I mean, I have, I have opened my mouth up so many times and the wrong stuff has come out, uh, way too many times than I want to remember. Um, and one that still haunts me and I'll, I'll, I can do this in public now is to apologize to Dr. Weber when I, the first time you got me out to work with the, with the college drum line, and I made some comments about a drum corps that I was really frustrated with, but three or four people from that drum line were in that drum corps. And it was just, it was very unprofessional. And you just got to remember that, that what you're doing is to help them, not to make you feel better. It has nothing, to, in fact, it has nothing to do with you at all. It's all about them. Uh, whatever you're, uh, whatever you're doing. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the biggest things that I t brought on to my own teaching and stuff like that is the whole just, it's about the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about, you know, it's not about me. It's not about my ego. It's not about trying to show off what I can do. It's putting them in the best situation that they can be in. Right. And, you know, I will, uh, I will do this to embarrass uh, Dr. Weber one more time. Um, yeah. Well, what I'll say is that Dr. Weber is one of the most humble human beings on the planet. And he doesn't have to talk about his drum line and how good they are, because all you have to do is watch Michigan State and go, oh, dear God, that's a college drum line. And he's had uh, uh, Tom McGillan, I remember, texted me when you guys, uh, I'm pointing at you like everybody can see who I'm pointing at. 
uh, when when Michigan State was playing at PAS one time, um, and because they were playing at BOA at the same time, and I think it was maybe the percussion instructor at Blue Devils or somebody came up and said, that's the best college drum line I've ever seen in my life. Somebody came up and said that. John didn't have to go and talk about it at all. All right. It just happened. Um, you don't have to go out and, and, you know, sometimes I teach this to a fault about not being a self promoter because in this day and age, I think that might be a mistake. You know, that's me being old. Uh, but you know, you let the teaching and let the results of your drum line do the talking and, and you won't have to, you won't ever have to, to brag about your own line or anything like that because they've done it for you. Um, and I mean, that's happened with me a lot down here being, you know, very lucky. We're kind of in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Um, and I ask some of these guys, why is it that you, uh, you know, why is it that you were looking at OSU and nine times out of 10, the students will tell me, and I'll really talk to all these rookies about it, um, this year, nine times out of 10 is, well, I saw this video on YouTube and it was just really cool. And I want to be a part of that, you know? And so I didn't have to go there and talk to their drumline or anything like that. It was just what was up there. And I know that, you know, another thing you want to be careful of is not putting too much stuff up, which I've been a little guilty of, is you don't need to put up the stuff that's average. Only put up the stuff that's good. <laughs> um, all right, so anybody else in here? John, I thought you were trying to say something at some yeah. point. No, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I thought I I I think uh, one thing that Wayne does uh, really well, though, and and when you're talking about beginning students, is uh, um, motivating it and making making it fun for everybody. And that comes down to making sure that the students come first, really. But is um, I always thought Wayne did a good job, no matter the skill level, no matter the type of uh, drum or anything. Wayne always made it very fun and very. Uh, um, very great to be at rehearsal and everything as well as performances so I think that's something else just to, in terms of when you when you start teaching is just do what you can to make sure that people are motivated and uh, are, are really enjoying what they're doing and and then if they love what they do then it'll pretty much take care of itself well and yeah looking at both you know uh, Dr. Wiggins, Dr. Weber, um, Mr. McGillan uh, and then some of the younger guys that are starting to make a name for themselves, Cole Williams. Uh, and they're all people that just really, really enjoyed what they were doing. And yeah, it's, I don't ever look at it as me as much as it's the environment that has been created for everybody to enjoy. Um, and, you know, and it, it, it's not that I teach less. And I don't know if, if John would, would maybe relate to this. It's not that I feel like I'm teaching less, but because it has been established all the older guys know what to do to transfer the information down to the younger guys, and it just kind of feeds itself. Well, I think that's something that we're all wanting to do, like in our studios and stuff too. Mm -hmm. You know, is get it to where like there's that sort of there's that uh, institutional history You're is the term more from your peers as you are from yeah. your teacher, which I think is important. So to wrap up here, what is one tip or a piece of advice that you would give to all of the students that are out there watching this? Well, I, I'll do two quick things because two different angles. It may seem dumb. Uh, it's for me to say this. When you go out and teach, watch your language. From the story that I told you, you never know when something you're just talking and you're comfortable and all of a sudden something falls out of your mouth and it's like, I shouldn't have said that in front of 14 year olds. OK, so that's the thing as a player. Um, and I'm actually going to say something about keyboard playing uh, when it comes to this. For those of you that are, are music majors and are drummers by trade. OK, you know, you've done this a lot. All you have to do, it's it really takes no more than than logic. How many hours do you play on a practice pad? Add that up for one week and make sure it's an equal amount on a keyboard. And I bet you get a whole lot better at the keyboard because, you know, we'll sit here and just do this all day. Well, I'm getting my chops better so I can be better at keyboard. You got to get behind the darn keyboard 
you know, and do the same thing. Uh, or whatever it is that you're, you know, looking to um, uh, to improve upon, but that to me is is one of the the most important things. Is it doesn't take a lot of thought. It's you know, when when somebody comes and say, well, I'm just having real trouble. I have a lot of trouble with this. Well, I may help them a little bit with with technique on this or that. Nine times out of the ten, it'll be well. How many times did you practice this week? Well, I, I practiced three times. Okay, well you're not going to get any better then because you only practice three times. It should have been every day and it should have been a couple hours every day. Then you can come to me with a question and, and a problem. So that's my, my advice is just be very logical with how much you practice. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing this. Thank you for everybody that was in here in the Zoom and everybody that was watching online as we went. Um, next week is Veronica Wicks, the former caption head at the Blue Knights. Um, and so we're looking forward to her as far as I know right now it's the same bat time same bat channel um, and to everybody out there just as you know everybody stay safe take care of each other pay attention to what you're being suggested to do to stay healthy and help others out and stuff like that because we've got a mess on our hands right now and if we want to band this fall we got to get it cleaned up as fast as we can so <laughs> Right. Well, thank you also, Tracy and University of Northern Alabama. North Alabama. Sorry. Sorry, I did, I did that one. You're time. cut. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not getting paid now, I know. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and then, of course, thanks to you, Tracy, and to uh, Dr. Weber, because I got to tell you that you guys inspire me just as much. I, I just sent for, you know, to for you two, I just sent a... Um, a text message to Darren on the way to a gig and I was listening to some of his drumming and I listened to his drumming before every gig. Uh, and, and so it's a student, a former student of mine that inspires me to go and perform. So it's all, it all comes back to you. All right. Whatever you give, it's going to come back, you know, twofold or tenfold. All right. Thank you to everyone.